So good to see you. Welcome to St. Andrews on this beautiful Sunday morning. Whether you're here in person or you're watching online, you are in the right place. Hey, everybody take a deep breath in and out. If you have breath in your lungs, the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that's what we're here to do. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord. One, two, three, four. Let's put our hands together like this. Rejoice, rejoice, let everything that has breath turn to say. Rejoice, rejoice, let everything that has breath Come on, Gina. I was created for a purpose, an instrument that magnifies out of the shadows, out of the dark. Yeah. 
rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And the reason we can rejoice is because of who He is. This is who He is. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storm may come and the wind may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. We'll just declare that. Great is your faithfulness. Sing sun to the setting same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Yeah. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to
as we just sang of God's faithfulness to us, that means that we praise a God who is a promise maker and a promise keeper. He makes covenants with his people as we see all throughout the Bible. And so today we're going to come to this table of communion remembering the new covenant that God established with us through the shed blood of Jesus, his son. So we're gonna go into our time of communion now. And uh, first we're gonna just join our hearts in prayer and prepare ourselves for receiving this sacrament. So let us join our hearts together. Lord God, almighty God, as we just sang of how faithful you are to us, we praise you. For that, we praise you for so many things. And that, Lord, we are here today because we are recipients of your many promises. The promises that you've made with the ancestors of our faith and that you made with us through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we praise you for how you are at work in this world, for how you're at work in our lives, how you're at work in this church, we have so many things to praise you for today, Lord. We have so many things to be grateful for, so many blessings, and we just lift those up to you. Maybe something small over the course of this last week or something really big, an answered prayer, time with family. We're grateful for our freedom in this country. Lord, there's, there's so much we can add to that list. And so we lift up our praises, our thanks. We lift up our hearts to you and just say, you are who we worship. You are the recipient of all praise, all glory. And Lord, we also admit that sometimes we don't live our lives praising you that sometimes we would much rather do things our way. And that sometimes we make choices based on our self-centeredness or maybe our fear that you're, you're not trustworthy. And we sin. And so Lord, we confess to you today as well that there are times we fall short. And sometimes we make a mess of things and so we're really grateful, Lord, that, that you hear our prayers of confession and that you don't leave us alone in the mess. That you come right alongside of us and you want to show us a better way to live. So may our hearts and our ears and our eyes be open to your way. And Lord, you also meet us wherever we are today. And maybe some of us come here today with pain many kinds of pain or grief or anxiety or stress and we just need to lean into your everlasting arms and that is a promise you've given us as well that we never do anything in this life alone that you strengthen us and guide us and so Lord we have that to praise you for as well and as we come to this time of communion, Lord, may it be a time that we're unifying with you, that we're reclaiming your presence in our lives, we're remembering that, we're, we're uniting with your strength, unifying with your purposes for our lives, remembering who we are, who you've created us to be. And we're getting real nourishment, spiritual nourishment from this bread and this juice that, that we will be strengthened by the, the power of your spirit. And so Lord, as we do take in these elements today, this bread and this juice, may they be reminders to us of your lavish grace and love and compassion. May we just take that in today, Lord. So we lift up these prayers to you in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, we are reminded that on the evening that Jesus was arrested when he was with his disciples, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke the bread. 
and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body, take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way afterward, he took the cup and he said, this cup is poured out as a new covenant, my shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you drink of this cup, remember me. And Paul tells us that when we eat this bread and drink from this cup on days like today, we are reminded of what Jesus did for us. And we're also reminded to look ahead expectantly to what's ahead, the day he comes again in glory. And so we praise him for that today as well. So brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the table of God for the people of God. We will have four stations up front and the ushers will help you come forward for your bread and your juice. You can take them on the spot or take them back to your seats if you wish. There will be a couple stations in the back as well. If you need gluten-free elements, just raise your hand and, and flag an usher and they'll come to you. So let us now remember the God who loves us in this sacrament. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to
So as we praise God today, and we just had this sacrament of communion where we are reconciled to our God, we're also reconciled to each other. So we're going to take a few moments now just to turn to each other and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Welcome home, St. Andrews. My name is Troy DeLuca, and I'm here to share with you a few things going on in the life of our church. First, our annual rummage sale is quickly approaching, and we need your help to make this the best thrift shop around. So head to sapres.org slash rummage sale to view the volunteer opportunities and sign up. Next, our men's ministry is going deep sea fishing. Join us for a great time of fellowship, fishing, and fish tacos. For all those details, you can go to sapres.org slash events for the time, the location, and the cost. Lastly, we are planning a mission trip to India, February 2025, where we'll be working alongside women rescued from sex trafficking, connecting with kids, and deepening our own faith in this process. If you're interested in serving, you can apply online or join us for an info meeting August 4th after our services. And if you have questions about any of this or are looking to get connected here at St. Andrews, please fill out a, a connect card or head to sapres.org slash next steps and someone from our team would love to talk to you. Now it's time to continue our worship by giving God his tithes and our offerings. Have a beautiful day, St. Andrews.
point of reference He spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light And as you Every prayer. 
You may be seated. Boy, talk about verbal imagery. That song gets me every time. How about you? Good morning, Saint. Yes, let's just thank our worship team for the, for the intentionality of, of curating songs so that it would help us and facilitate praise of our God who is most worthy. Well, good morning, church. If you are a guest here, welcome home to St. Andrews. If you're watching online, welcome home. Well, you're probably home, but welcome home anyway. And if you call this place uh, family and home, welcome home to you as well. My name is Manny. I'm one of the pastors. I have a, the honor and the privilege of being part of the team here. And today is an interesting day because we are talking about something that, that, that we've been doing and singing about this morning called Praise. We're three weeks into our summer series. And the series is titled Summer Playlist. You're on it. Taking great notes here. And so we're focusing on the major themes of the Psalms. Just like every movie that you watch has a genre, like drama, horror, uh, sappy romance, right? For those of you that like romantic movies. Um, the Psalms have its own genre as well. It has its own genre. And it's found, and it's called wisdom literature. So it's the wisdom of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, for the people of God, oftentimes written in poetic form. And the Psalms have, have served as a songbook for the people of God for generations, for thousands of years, for thousands of years. But the secret sauce to the Psalms is that no matter where or what stage you exist in your season of life or your situation, there is not like every psalm will speak to some place that you're at. Like wherever you're at, there's a psalm for that. There's no place that you could be standing in life that the psalm doesn't speak to you. But the goal isn't not just to speak to you, but the purpose of moving you from where you are to where God is. And also to reveal the closeness of God to you and I. So today's message is on the subject of praise. Now, praise isn't just limited to just like the psalms or what we do in church. We praise all the time. Um, in fact, you praise all the time. It, it's part of being human. Like, you go out on a date, gentlemen, and your date, your wife, girlfriend, whatever, you're, you're walking with them and they look really nice, what do you say? You look beautiful, that's a praise. Or you're like at the beach and you're looking at the gorgeous sunset that we have here on the Pacific coast. And you look at the beautiful scenery and what do you say? Wow, that is so beautiful. You're praising God or you're praising the beauty of creation that you see. But praise also shows up in lots of other places. In fact, there's a song that you might recognize if it's on your playlist. Check this out. Oh yeah. In your eyes, I get lost, I get washed away. Just as long as I'm here in your arms, I could be no better. All right, if you know it, sing it. You're simply the best, better than all the rest. All right, I can hear you. Ready? Anyone I've ever met. Not bad at all. Great job. <laughs> Great job. I can, I can see you guys singing at a karaoke um, tonight, if anyone's there. But 
What is this song doing? It's saying you're simply the best. You're not just the best, but you're better than all the rest. And you're better than anyone I've ever met. It's ascribing greatness or beauty or love to a person. Let's look at what the Psalms are doing here. In Psalm 8, in fact, why don't we, we, we stand for the reading of God's word. And let's read this together. Psalm 8, chapter 1 through 4, and then um, verse 9. Sorry, chapter 8, 1 through 4, verse 9. Ready, set, go. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Wow. Let's read this one too since I have you standing. Ready? Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and my King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate Okay. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing of the joy of righteousness. Here's why. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on his children. That's a lot of scripture. Great job. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You may be seated. See, out of all the, the themes found in the Psalms, like thanksgiving, um, rejoice, um, lament, gladness, remembrance, love, guess which one takes the cake? Praise. There's 150 psalms, but 180 references to praise God. So here's a question. If there's 180 uh, references to praise God in the psalms, if that's in the wisdom songbook at the heart of the Bible, uh, don't you think it's probably important to check it out? I think so too. It's kind of a big deal. So today, I want to share five insights, five compelling insights, hopefully, on the power of praise and why we can't afford not to as the children of God, okay? So five insights on the power of praise and why as children of the Most High God, why we cannot afford not to praise. Uh, let me say it in a different way. If we call ourselves children of God, which means God is our Father, then the practice of praise is a thermometer revealing the temperature of our spiritual lives. Let me say it again. That the practice of praise is a thermometer revealing the temperature of our spiritual lives, but it's also a thermostat setting the temperature of our spiritual lives. So it's both a thermometer, it gauges the pulse of your spiritual life, and it's also a thermostat, it engages or it sets the temperature for our spiritual lives as well. So let's jump in to these five insights on the power and the necessity of praise for the life of the believer. So here we go. Point number one, praising God does not add anything to God. Can you say that with me, church? Praising God does not add anything to God. It's like you're standing at the beach and you're looking at a sunset. Again, we're, we live in one of the most beautiful places on earth. And you're looking at the sunset. And what do you say? Wow. That is so beautiful. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I just, I'm a big scenery, I'm, I'm a sucker for scenery. I love looking at scenery. And I just, just, like, I take it all in. Guess what? My praise of the scenery doesn't do anything to the scenery. It, it doesn't add to its beauty. It doesn't. Because guess what? It doesn't need me <laughs> to, to, to tell it how beautiful it is. Right? 
on its own, it stands on its own. Therefore, when we praise God, we're not adding anything to God. He is sufficient in himself. Our praise doesn't provide God a service or a benefit that fills the voids in his crack, like in his, in his, like, his personality cracks. He doesn't have those things. He's not like you and I, right? That is God. All creation, as we just sang in this last song, all of creation already praises God. The mountains, the systems, science, all the things that God has created on earth already points to its designer. The design points to the designer. It's like looking at a Van Gogh painting. Like it's pointing to the painter, right? It's doing that on its own. Creation exists as a testament and a reflection of the creator's genius and greatness and creativity. If God needed our praise, then I would suggest that he's either like really needy or really narcissistic. Like imagine, you know, like you create something that just every day, I worship you, I worship you, you're so amazing, you're so good, I, I love you, you're the best. So, like, oh, thank you, you know, I really needed that. That's kind of like, that, it's like, that's not the kind of God of the Bible, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible isn't like Zeus and Hera and, and uh, you know, these, these gods of the Greek, um, like ancient Greek days, that needed the praise of, of you and I to, to be upheld. That's not the God of the Bible. If it was, I'd say, let's find another book. But that is not the case. Check out what Acts says. Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 24, 25. This is really cool. It says, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs. You got that? Human hands cannot serve the needs of God. For he has no needs. He himself gives life. And, and breath to everything, and he satisfies everything. So, so the writer of this, of this book, Luke, is taking, like, the narrative, and he's, like, flipping around. Like, here's who God is, and here's what he doesn't need. In fact, on, like, the reversal is, in fact, you need him, and everything comes from him. Can I get an amen, church? The praise of the children do not add anything to God. That is why he is constant in love, consistent in faithfulness, and correct in his judgments. Can you say that with me? God is constant in love, consistent in faithfulness, and correct in his judgment. So why praise him if it doesn't add anything to him? Because the universe, by its sheer existence, already does that. It does that like a beautiful painting, pointing to the painter. And when you and I do praise God, what happens is that we're now joining with the grain of creation that's pointing praise to God. But here's what's really interesting, too. Of all the creatures in the created order, humans, you and I, are the only creatures that have the ability not to praise God. That you and I, of all the creatures created in God's good creation, are the only ones that have the ability. Like a rock doesn't say, I'm not going to praise God. Like by being a rock, it praises God. By being the mountain, it praises God. The solar system, it praises God. All, all things that God created point to God. But we're the ones that have the ability not to reflect praise back to God. And also, we're also the only creatures in creation that are actually made in God's image too. Figure that out. When we don't praise God, we're going against the grain of creation. And naturally what happens is, whether we believe it, like it, think of it or not, we praise something else. Something else gets lifted high in our lives. It could be you, it could be an, like an ideology, it could be like your political persuasion, it could be like some, some other religion, it could be like yourself and your pleasures and your, you know, a power position, pleasure, all that stuff. Like something fills the void of your life, something becomes your deity. Right? And over time, what you, what you chew on, you end up hungering for even more. And that is how idolatry is born. The great North, Af um, North African theologian, uh, St. Augustine, says this. He says, idolatry is simply disordered love. Where, where virtues move into vices when they become disordered. That's all that it is. 
So praise is for God's glory, but guess what? It's for your good and for my good. Second, praising God is my weapon as a child of God. Say this with me. Praising God is my weapon as a child of God. Weapon? Wait, did the pastor just say a weapon? How could praise be a weapon? For our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood, but against powers, rules, and principalities. There's a war that is raging. Like, I bet if we were to open the hood of your life, there's battles raging. There's discouragement. There's anxiety. There's fear of tomorrow. There's shame of the past. There's things that you need that right now you're like, God, I need you to come through. There's struggles that, you, you, you know, we mask it pretty well. We don't want the world to know. And in our most, like, most loneliest moments, they come out. All of us have battles. Worship and praise is a weapon in the hand and in the life of a believer. Because it's a different kind of weapon. It's a weapon that if you told somebody outside the church, they'd be like, okay, you guys are crazy. But it's not. It's like taking a sword into a battlefield, but it's cyber warfare. Like, do you, do you get it? It's like, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, you don't win cyber warfare with swords and guns and knives. The weapon that God gives us is praise. Look at what Isaiah says here. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praises from the ends of the earth. Sing all who sail the seas and all who live in distant lands. Um, let the whole world glorify the Lord. Let it sing his praise. And then what does it say? The Lord will march forth like a mighty hero. He will come out like a warrior. Full of fury, he will shout his battle cry and crush his enemies. Like, when you, when you do the first part, when we, do the, when we engage in praise, when we give God glory, when it comes out of, our, out of our lips because it flows from our heart, you know, God comes like a wrecking ball. Like, I keep on thinking of Miley Cyrus in my head, like, coming out with a wrecking ball. Like, like, God comes out and he's like, I got you. I've had you, but you get it. Because if, if you thank God for the answer to your prayers on on the back end, there's no faith in that. You've, you've already said thanks for what you've received. But when you praise God on the front end when you haven't received, that takes faith. That takes insight. That takes trust. God is looking for trust. He's looking for gratitude as well. It's easier to say thank you on the back end. It's a lot harder to say, God, I trust you even when I don't see that you are doing all things. You're working through this. So how many of us today have battles that we'd rather have God fight on our behalf? I don't know about you, but I do. Some of us think we've given battles to God, but actually we've prayed about it, but we've, we're holding on to it because we haven't praised it to God. When you praise, you literally say, God, I trust you, and I trust that you will do what you think is right, because he's what? He's just, and he knows all things. But he comes to our defense. It's because we're not practicing the praise part that we just do the prayer part that sometimes our, our battles, like, we not only hold on to it, but they kind of hold on to us. But praise ushers in the power of God into, into our lives and into our circumstances and into the spaces and places where our deepest battles are waging. And God desires to do something not just for you, but when you praise God, he's actually doing it through you. God doesn't just desire to do things for us, but he, he wants to do it through us. And praise does that. It's a powerful weapon, but it's Sometimes most effective when you least feel like doing it. You know what I'm talking about? Like who's, who's ever, you know, been like, oh, I don't want to go to church this morning. Oh, the pillow's like extra soft. You know, it's like a cold day. And then you get up, the kids have made a mess and you got to get them ready and dressed. Or, or let's say like on your way out, you know, the dog does something in the middle of the car. I don't know. It's just like stuff happens on your way to church. It's like, ah. Oh. Who's ever came 
came to church and just like felt like, ah. Oh. And then that's exactly why we have coffee out there. That's for people like you and for me, right? And then, and then you get in and, and then Brandon leads worship and Gina leads worship and, and the team leads and you're like, oh, okay, I'm kind of getting into it. And you start singing. If creation sings your praise, Lord, so will I. And then you, all of a sudden, like action moves and your heart follows action, right? Because sometimes that, that happens. It's not always the heart and then action. Like you move into it, your body moves there and then your heart kind of joins you. Who's ever done that? And then like you've left saying, boy, that was a waste of time. <laughs> I should have stayed in bed. No one, nobody here does that. We've never done that. Right, church? It changes things. It changes things. So if you wait to praise God after he answers, that's called Thanksgiving. But if you praise God in advance, that's faithful praise. And it is a weapon in the hands of the child of God. All right. Number three, praising God lifts my spirit on the heels of what I just said right now. When you praise God, it energizes your soul, it lifts your spirit, and it also changes your mood. It does. It does. Praising God lifts your spirit, especially when you praise God with others. What we do in private almost always bleeds into the public spaces of our lives. If you're a generous person, like, like in private, then it bleeds into your public life. That's just how it is, right? There's this power uh, where God's people are gathered together and they praise God together. And it's such a great reminder of who God is because this is what the church has been doing for thousands of years. The people of God have been doing it for millennia. I mean, it's fine. You can do it online and in your PJs and worship God in your PJs while you're eating your bowl of Cheerios. And that's okay because that's praise too. But there's something that happens within you when you join the assembly of believers together. Like, the, you know, like we're all a choir and we're singing to this audience of one. It changes us. It lifts up our spirit. Psalms, uh, Psalm 42, 5 until 6 says, Why well, am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you. Praise isn't uh, an act that pushes away the realities of life. It's not. We're not like, you know, let's just give glory to God. Okay, we'll worry about that stuff later. No, God's like, bring that with you. Sometimes our battles and, and the rocks in our backpack are really heavy. And we drag ourselves to God's house. And we drag ourselves to open up the, the pages of his word and to read the Psalms. And we lift our hands high, but it's just really heavy because everything in us and around us, just we, we, we don't feel like doing it. We don't feel like doing it. But there is power when we do that, when we hope, when we praise, and when we remember, Right? Hope, praise, and remember. Some of us might be fighting discouragement today. Some of us might be fighting disappointment today. Some of us are fighting anxiety today. And there's things in our lives that we're worried about. And it makes sense because when you look around you and you look at the state of our world and you look at maybe the brokenness within, maybe it's broken relationships, maybe what you want hasn't happened and maybe what you did not want, has happened. It makes sense to be disappointed and discouraged. God doesn't brush over that and say, oh, well, just praise me. When your praise moves towards God, his peace and his presence and his provision moves towards you. I'm going to say it again. When your praise moves towards God, his peace, his presence, and his provision moves towards you you. Praise has the power to change our point of reference. It's about God, but the benefits are for you and for me. Fourth, praising God enlarges my perception of God. Praising God enlarges my perception of God. Now, I left something on the chair. I'm going to go get it real quick. So if you've got the camera, sorry about that. Um, um, how many of you own one of these? <laughs> how many of you need one of these? <laughs> 
it's a magnifying glass, right? And, uh, and it helps. Not with your iPad, because you can just do that, and it just makes everything bigger. Um, but, okay, check this out. Psalm 69 says this, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will what? Magnify him with thanksgiving. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. How many of you know what a magnifying glass is made to do? Well, I was thinking about this. It does two things. It makes bigger, right, what you're focusing on. And it, it makes it enlarged. And second, it makes things clear. It clarifies your perception of what you're focusing on. Praising God expands our perception of God and our ability to see things clear. Praising God expands your vision of who God is. It doesn't like, you know, if you're looking at a, at a page, it doesn't actually change the text. Like the font doesn't go from like 12 to 15. You just see it better. It, it expands it in your perception, right? So here's the thing. The bigger God becomes in your life and in my life, the clearer we see him in your life and in my life. I should say it again. I didn't get an amen on that. The bigger God becomes in my life, the clearer I see him in my life. The bigger God becomes in my life, the smaller the problems and fears look in my life as well. The opposite is also true, by the way. The smaller God becomes in our perception, the larger our fears and our problems and our dilemmas become as well. So, what does praise do? It magnifies God. You see more of God. You get a better glimpse of him when you praise him. It changes your internal temperature. And you see things clear. I think C.S. Lewis said something. It's not up there. But he says something like, I believe in Christianity like I believe in that the sun rises. Not, only because, not because I see the sun, but because I see all things because of the sun. It's the same way when you praise. Not only do you see God moving in your life, but you end up seeing his movement in your life. The fifth and our last point. Praising God helps me sense his presence. Say that with me. Praising God helps me sense his presence. Psalm 140 says, Surely the righteous will praise your name, and they will live in your presence. And they will live in your presence. Say this with me. When praise increases in my life, so does my ability to sense his presence in my life. Let's do it together. When praise increases in my life, so does my ability to sense his presence in my life. Here's a little secret. Praise and presence go hand in hand. Praise and presence go hand in hand. Can I get an amen? amen. Now notice I use the word sense. I use the word sense because how many of us have felt like God at one point in your life or maybe now has been a million miles away? Like you felt just distant from God. God, where are you? God, where are you? And so many, as you go through the Psalms, you'll, you'll see the psalmist crying, God, where are you? My enemies are at my door. Where are you, God? I've been praying to you. One of the challenges, it's not on my notes, but one of the challenges sometimes with kind of the mentality, uh, like, it's easy at church to get into this victorious mentality, like, like everything is peachy when it's actually not. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever felt that way, like I got to kind of sanitize my life before I come in the doors, or I got to have like my act together, or like I have to have my life in order to, to partake of, of the bread and the juice, forgetting that like around Jesus' table was this guy named Judas, and Jesus fed him too. Like he invites us with, with our brokenness to the table. It's not a reward for the righteous, but sustenance for the broken. But when we feel like God is a million miles away, the reality is he's not. 
There has never been a moment in your life that even if you felt that he was a million miles away, that God was actually a million miles away. Because our circumstances and our fears and our anxieties augment our reality. So we feel like God is distant or maybe we're like living in shame. We've done something that doesn't honor God. And we're like God, and, and you feel his presence, but he's, he's everywhere. He's always been with you. There has never been a point in your life that God has not surrounded you and has not... Even in difficult times and you're like, God, where were you? Here's something worth writing down. That God is everywhere, but he shows up where he's wanted. God is everywhere, but he shows up where he's wanted. God's desire always is to draw us to himself. Always. Always. So praise isn't just the marinating of our of our moods, you know, like the first half of the service. That, if that's what praise is, if, if our songs are just about getting us prepared for the message, then we've completely missed what worship is. All of it's worship. Because all of it belongs to God. Check, check this out. Psalms 104 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and then what? And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. It's good to have the attitude of gratitude. I am not saying you shouldn't. Be grateful. Be a grateful people. But, but check this out. Gratitude gets you into the gate. Thanksgiving gets you onto the property. According to the psalm, and praise gets you what? Into the courts of the king. Thanksgiving gets you through the gate. Praise gives you an audience with the king. And God desires to be with us. And praise is our way of ushering the power and the presence and the provision of God into our lives no matter where we are. So what do we say? We said, what, first, praising God doesn't add anything to him. It's for God's glory and for our good, right? Second, praising God is my weapon as a child of God. That when we praise God... God's provision moves towards us, and he fights our battles. Third, praising God lifts my spirit. It moves us from discouragement to encouragement. Fourth, praising God enlarges my perception of God. And then fifth, praising God helps me to sense his presence. Will you stand with me? We're about to sing a song as the band comes up, and I'm, and I'm just going to Read the words. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all the anxiety. Let it rise. Church, let it rise. We sing your name in the dark, and it changes everything. We sing with all we are. And we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let it rise. Because we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. How many of us have giants that, that God needs to fight on our behalf? Fear cannot survive when we praise you. Why? Because the God of breakthrough is on your side. And on your side. And on your side. And on my side and on your side. Forever, we will lift them high. With all creation, we're joining the grain of creation. We cry, God, we praise you. We 
You know, uh, when you go to a football game and your team scores, what do you do? Yeah! Right? Or when, you, when your kid, like, like shoots a three-pointer and they win the game, yeah! But sometimes in church, it's kind of like, eh, I don't want to lift my hands. So for a second, I want our bodies, our, our physical bodies, we're embodied creatures with, with our bodies to reflect our hearts as we sing praise to God. Now you can do the forklift prayer or the touchdown prayer or, or the like, you know, the fishing rod prayer, right? Just find a posture as we sing this last song together. There are giants in your life and in my life that can only be overcome with the power of praise. You can go to 20 Bible studies and go to all of them. You can do a whole bunch of things. But if praise is not part of the practice in your life, some of these giants will be holding on to you as you're holding on to it. So let's just sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Sing Amen. Church, may praise be your weapon, may praise be your comfort, may praise be the song that you sing, and the world will look at you and say, there's something different about this person, because they're not waiting for the answer, they're praising God through the storms. God bless you, St. Andrews. Have a great week.